Today, I sit down with Kristen Weatherall and ask her some of your questions about cultivating a hunger for God's Word. A few weeks ago, we asked people to send in questions related to what it looks like to stay motivated and excited about reading the Bible in every season of life. We received lots of questions from around the world about everything from keeping our Bible reading time fresh, to making time for God's Word as a busy parent, to engaging with Scripture when we're struggling with grief. Kristen Weatherall is a wife, a mother, a writer, and a speaker. She's also the author of several books, including Help for the Hungry Soul, Eight Encouragements to Grow Your Appetite for God's Word from Crossway. Let's get started. Well, Kristen, thanks so much for joining me again for this special bonus listener Q&A episode of the Crossway podcast. Thanks for having me back. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. So a while back, we invited listeners to submit their questions for you related to cultivating a love for God's word, a hunger for God's word, Uh, something that we all obviously want, but sometimes we all, to some extent, struggle to have in our own lives. Mm. And we received many questions from people all around the U.S., but one of the main themes that was kind of present throughout all of them was just a sense of feeling maybe a little bit discouraged, a little bit like, Mm -hmm. I want more out of my Bible reading. Do you resonate with that? Is that Mm -hmm. something you felt? Do you hear that from people that you're talking to and working with on a regular basis? Yes. Yes. The answer is yes. (laughs) So Um, so we're not alone mm -hmm. when we feel discouraged maybe by our Bible reading habits or lack thereof. No, this is such a universal feeling among Christians. Mm. And it's one of the reasons why I wrote Help for the Hungry Soul, because I was seeing it in myself. I was hearing it from people in my small group, in my church. My my husband is a pastor. So even just hearing him processing generally, what is the church struggling with? That was a common struggle, the sense of guilt over just not doing what we're supposed to Mm -hmm. when it comes to the Bible, a desire for things to change though, but also a a sense of feeling stuck in how to make a change. Yeah. So I think, I think a lot of us can grow discouraged. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) If not all of us. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's a great segue into the first question that I want to talk about today. And it's related to this sense of feeling stuck. Uh, And so here's the question that we got from somebody. And I love it because it's a very on the ground in the trenches kind of question. It's it's a raw question that I think we all can resonate with. Uh, So this person writes in, when it comes to hungering after God's word, where do you even start? Uh, When you're in a dry season and the thought of picking up your Bible is overwhelming, or when you're in the trenches of the little years of motherhood and time seems like a luxury that you, you really can't afford, or when God maybe seems silent and the pages of the Bible appear dull. Uh, Big question there, where do I start in any one of those situations that we might be facing where it's hard to be in the Word? Yeah. What would you say to that? Oh, I just love that question. I feel that question. (laughs) I am in the trenches of motherhood. I have three little ones, Mm. and it is hard, and I have gone through many dry seasons. The word that comes to my mind is helplessness. It's starting really with a heart posture before the Lord of saying, I am helpless to stir up any desire in myself for this, Mm. perhaps as well as, you know, finding the time and the resources to spend time with you in your word. And um, man, when we humble ourselves before the Lord, his promise is that he draws near. And what, what a sweet thing that is to be able to cry out to God and say, God, you have given me this precious book where you are speaking to me. And yet, I don't want it (laughs) like I should and, you know, and, or I want it, but I I just can't seem to find the time or the energy to open it or to enjoy it. Help me. Mm. And so I think that's the right place to start. That's the place that scripture itself would tell us to start. Who does God draw near to? Isaiah says it's the one who is broken and contrite in spirit and who trembles before his word. So let's start there. (laughs) Lord, I need your help. Um, It's a heart posture. That can be such a counterintuitive way to start because I think sometimes when we feel like we are helpless, we feel like we're failing in something, we can feel ashamed by that. We can kind of want to run away from that. And we all have different ways of coping with those feelings. Some of us try harder in our own strength and kind of just try to push our way through it. Or some of us might be in denial and not want to acknowledge that like we're struggling in some way. Uh, But it sounds like you're kind of saying, no, actually, maybe we need to lean in to those feelings of helplessness and bring those to God instead of 
doing something else with them. Right. And I think that, that the church, the body of Christ, would greatly benefit from us being more transparent in that way. Because I, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of, like we've said, discouragement, guilt, and shame associated with it. So we tend to maybe not speak up mm. and not say, hey, brother in Christ, hey, sister in Christ, I need you to pray for me. Yeah. <laughs> because this is not going well. I have not read my Bible for months. <laughs> And I need you to pray for me. I think we feel ashamed by that. But what a blessing to have the body of Christ surrounding us in prayer or even bolstering us with ideas for getting in the word. That can be such a blessing. Mm. So I think there's benefit there. Yeah. So yeah, bringing it both to God and though to other Christians right, as well. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe as a follow-up question then, for the person who's maybe gotten started, they've done that. They've kind of started to read the Bible more consistently. They've maybe gotten help from other Christians uh, then the question is, how do I maintain a steady habit after the initial zeal wears off? That's another question that we got from a listener. Yeah. I would encourage the listeners, first, to ask God for help. Second, to express a commitment, not only before the Lord, but to someone else. Maybe you even write it down somewhere, mm. but say, I, I need you to hold me to this. I want to be in God's word more because I know that it's good for my soul. And because I, I want to know him. I want to love him. I want to walk with him. So would you please ask me how this is going in a week? <laughs> Grab some accountability. I think that there's wisdom to making a commitment. Um, uh, I would, one question on that, the yeah. accountability side. I think that can be an intimidating word, mm-hmm. right? The idea of asking someone, inviting someone else into this and even encouraging them, hey, ask me how I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that can be kind of a scary prospect. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you wrestled with that? A little bit, but I think, and I'm sure that we'll get into this. I think sometimes the the, the aspect or the, the idea of accountability seems scary because we're setting ourselves up for some kind of standard that maybe it's too high a standard. And by that, I mean, we have this idea of being in the Bible that we call quiet time, which we've talked about in Mm. the past. But so much of this idea of quiet time is a cultural construct and kind of a a burden that we put upon ourselves. Like it has to be an hour too long. I have to be, I have to have commentaries in front of me and studying the Bible in depth. And all those are really good things. But the reality is the Bible not only doesn't command that idea of quiet time, it's not realistic for hungry people with full lives. You know, I'm a mama of three young kids and it's hard to grab an hour in the Bible. It's really hard. And so if you told me, well, okay, so I'm holding you accountable to that standard. How did you do? Of course, I'm going to say, well, gulp. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't do that this week. Right. Did you spend time with God and his word this week? That sounds a lot broader. Mm. And that could look like a lot of different things. We can be creative in our pursuit of the Lord in his word. Yeah. And so I think accountability might feel scary because maybe we're afraid, we're afraid of failing. We're afraid of being shamed. But if we also remember that the body of Christ is for us, then anybody who's going to hold us accountable loves us, right? Mm. And they're doing so because they love us. Yeah. So I think a couple things to to remember there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So keep going. Sh- share what else you were going to say about how to help develop a, a habit. Yeah. Um, I would say to start small. It's, you know, it's great to come at this with big goals. I'm going to wake up an hour earlier and I'm going to read for an hour. Um, and that's great if you can do that. That's wonderful. But I would say start small. Set your set your alarm clock five minutes earlier, 10 minutes earlier, and choose a verse to meditate on. Start there. Start small. And with that, you know, you just kind of watch the deposits add up. These things add up over time. I heard someone say once that it's a drip feeder. And the little drips, the little drops don't seem like much in themselves. But over time, drip, you're watching the drops add up and suddenly you have you have a whole resource mm. of water to, to thrive on. Yeah. So uh, start small, watch the deposits add up, and leverage the gaps in your day, you know, ditching that myth of quiet time. Yeah, at a certain um, time, first thing in the morning, perhaps. Yeah, so. you know, leverage the gaps in your day. Maybe you do have an hour to spend before your kids get up. That is wonderful, and go for it. But if you don't, do you have five or 10 minutes in the car line waiting for your children? Do you have a commute to work when you could turn on an audio Bible? Leverage the gaps in your day because they matter. And again, those small deposits add up. And habits are sticky. So if you have 
um, the opportunity to kind of be in the same time, you know, same place every day, do that. I have a spot in my living room. It's just my spot. I could read anywhere in our house, I suppose, but like it's a, just a, a in your house. It's, a phys- it's just a spot on my couch. I leave my Bible right there. You know, I'm not looking for it. It's just there. And so I would encourage the listeners to just pick a spot, pick mm. a time. Doesn't mean that that time can't change, but habits are sticky. So if it can be the same, that is super helpful. And then I also thought too, if you're struggling uh, with starting, maybe start with someone else. Mm. So grab a friend, grab a neighbor. It could be a believer who you want to dive into the depths of God's word alongside. Maybe it's an unbeliever. You know, maybe it's a neighbor and you, and you want to invite them to read the gospel of John together. Grab someone else because, you know, there's multiplied joy in in reading God's word together and hearing another person's insights and their questions. And I've heard people say that that's super helpful too, hmm. to grab a friend. So yeah, accountability isn't always somebody else kind of looking in and saying, hey, have you done it today? Sometimes it's someone doing it right alongside with you. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be the best way. Uh, I'm struck that a lot of the things you mentioned, whether it's picking a certain time of day and trying to be consistent or even a physical location. Some of those are insights that we, we see in the broader secular world when it comes to f- habit formation. Mm. That like there's, we, sometimes we can think of habits as like purely in our minds, but actually there's a kind of a tangible whole body dynamic to our habits uh, mm-hmm. that sometimes we, we maybe neglect when it comes to our spiritual disciplines. That's right. And I wonder if we do so because we the emotions aren't there. We just don't feel like, you know, doing whatever it may be in this case, I don't really feel like reading my Bible or my day is just so busy. It's just hard to even get started. But every, there's a principle here because everything that I do for myself, for example, my body exercising that is hard and that I don't feel like doing, the more I do it, the more I want to do it Mm -hmm. and the more I benefit from it. And the same goes for reading the word. When we draw near to the Lord and his word, he promises that he will satisfy the longing soul. And that might look different for every person. And it might take time, you know, that drip feed effect. But it's good for our souls, right? Just like exercise is good for my body. And I have found that the more I read, the more I want to read. So perhaps take that as a challenge, whoever's listening. (laughs) Um, Open your Bible. And do it again the next day and do it again the next day and just see what happens yeah. Just see what God does. Yeah. Sometimes though we can, we, we kind of expect when it comes to exercising that it's not going to feel very good. Mm-hmm. Most of the time for most Ooh, of us, it hurts. Yeah, it hurts. <laughs> and it's really hard to just get out of bed and, and get those shoes on and start, start jogging. Yeah. Um, we kind of expect the Bible might be different. It might feel mm-hmm. better right away. Yeah. Well, I think we've been very much you know, fed that in a culture that, that likes ease and comfort Mm. and is constantly innovating. So that we, yeah, instant gratification, quick results. And so, you know, it's not going to be that way. The work of God's word is a, is an unseen, supernatural, uh, slow work. That doesn't mean that God can't do quick and miraculous things. He does all the time, but it's a slow and unseen work typically. And um, that is not what we're used to hearing. <laughs> it's not what we're used to, to doing. And so, sure, can reading the word sometimes feel a little like we're exercising our faith muscles? And that can be hard. That can feel rough. It can. But is the, is the end result worth it? Is our faith in Christ strengthened as a result? Yes. Mm. You know, and, that, and that is a promise. And so it's worth going to, yeah. even when it's hard. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a great uh, next question that kind of maybe is from the perspective of someone who is in a habit of reading the Bible. Mm-hmm. Uh, someone writes in, I, I know that we are to read our Bibles because it's the right thing to do, but I feel like I'm in a rut with it. How do I get myself back into a place where I crave reading the Bible? Do you have any practical tips for when I spend time in the Bible to help me get more out to help me get out of this rut that I'm in. Yes. Oh, I feel like I'm in the rut right now. Mm. So I I feel that question. Um, it's happened many times before. So I think, I think what's helpful too is just to realize that um, these dry seasons do happen and that doesn't make you a bad Christian. Yeah, sometimes we think, <laughs> what am I doing wrong? Why am I feeling like this yeah, right now? Yeah, and that doesn't mean that, that my heart is perfect because it's not. Right. Yeah. So there, there, there probably are heart issues going on. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're a bad Christian. We all walk through it. And, and I think that it's helpful to remember that God is not prescriptive about how we spend time in his word. 
he's, he just wants our hearts. Mm. He just wants us near to him. So what I have found by experience is that I need to switch things up mm. when I'm in a rut. Mm. Usually my rut happens because I'm, I'm a very uh, routine personality. I'm very type A. I like routine. And so my rut happens because I just keep doing the same thing, the same Bible reading plan, which is great. But I have found that if I switch things up, that helps so much to have fresh perspective, to, you know, feel like I have different springboards for for praying back to God and talking to him in response to what I'm reading. So what might some of those things be, like different methods, ways that we could switch it up? Well, you could slow down or you could speed up. So Mm. you could meditate on fewer verses. Let's say you're kind of in the habit of reading a few chapters out of a reading plan. Ditch that for now. Slow down. Take a small chunk of scripture, a couple verses, and just mull them over Mm. (laughs) and ask questions about it. It's a very different experience. Yeah, it's so different. Yeah. Or maybe you need to speed up. Maybe that's kind of what you've been doing, just opening your Bible for small sections, and you would benefit from taking a book of the Bible, maybe a shorter book of the Bible and reading it all the way through (laughs) and asking some questions about that and, um, and praying out of that and talking to God from that. Um, perhaps, uh, you could read a book alongside what you're reading. So I, my reading plan just took me to Job and I know from past experience, it is hard for me to get through Job (laughs) because the middle section is so hard to understand. And I said, okay, I'm kind of feeling like I'm in this rut anyway. Do I just kind of toss out the reading plan? What do I do? So I picked up this great Christopher Ash book. Um, I believe it's a crossway book on uh, trusting God in the darkness. Mm -hmm. And so I read that as I read Job. And that was so wonderful. It was so refreshing to not just have my own thoughts, but Christopher Ash's thoughts on Job. And he helped me understand the book so much better. And I could, I could praise God for that and pray out of that and kind of apply it to my life. So maybe read a book alongside. That kind of relates to that, that book of the Bible or that passage. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe you haven't followed a reading plan, follow a reading plan. That'll give you an actual plan to follow. Turn on an audio Bible. If you're, if you're kind of in a rut with reading, try listening. It's a very different experience when you're listening to the word. So we could go on and on, but I would say if you're in a rut, make a change. Hmm. You have permission to mm. make a change. Do you think that's uh, something that, that people struggle with, that feeling like they have permission to try something new, to experiment? Certain personalities. I wouldn't say that that's everyone. Because some people are, are in a rut because they're not in the word. And so their rut is, but how do I get there? And that yeah. was the previous question that you asked. How do I even start? Right. Where does the appetite even come from? And then others of us are perhaps in the word often. And so the rut is... <laughs> I'm bored, you know, I'm, this feels so over familiar to me. Um, I do think it's a pretty, one of the two, you know, I think will touch many people. Yeah, that's a great, uh, another question we got is related to that over familiarity issue. So the, the person writes in, for those who have been reading their Bibles for a long time, how do we keep ourselves from the danger of familiarity so that we can continue to see Jesus with fresh mm-hmm. eyes. And I wonder if, you know, this person is maybe less asking, how do I feel motivated or excited to read the mm-hmm. Bible? But they just kind of feel like, you know, I want to make sure I'm getting new things out of God's word as I engage with it over and over again, and especially mm-hmm. related to the gospel and to Jesus. What, what advice would you give for guarding against this overfamiliarity, this assuming mm-hmm. we kind of know what it says already? Yeah. Well, I love the story in Luke's gospel, chapter 24, when Jesus has been crucified and has risen, but there are two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus and they're talking about everything that's happened. They're probably so discouraged. Mm -hmm. We thought that this guy was the hope of Israel and now he's gone. What are we to make of this? And then Jesus appears and (laughs) kind of walks with them and they don't recognize him. Scripture says that they don't recognize him. And they're recounting to him all of these things that have happened recently. And um, then Jesus basically says, have you not seen this in scripture? Everything in Moses and the prophets has pointed to this. And it wasn't until later when Jesus opened up their eyes to see that they could recognize him. And I think that that story is a wonderful encouragement for us who, who know a lot about Jesus, who love him who were in his word all the time, but have grown very familiar with a lot of things about him. Calling upon him to open our eyes freshly, that we would not just uh, read his word like it's a book, but seek him in the word, and to be able to see his, his heart and his glory there, 
I think that that story encourages us to start there and um, convicts us, right? That we can, we can miss him. Mm. (laughs) We can read the Bible to check off a list, even to feel good about ourselves or to solve some kind of a problem that's going on in our lives. But if we're missing the person to whom scripture points, we are missing the whole point. Mm. So, you know, I, Again, I have been there. I think those of us who teach and write and preach out of the word, my husband is a pastor, I'm a writer, over-familiarity is a danger. And we often pray against this kind of like professional Christianity. Yeah. We want to know him. We want to abide with him. And so I would say prayer. and, um, And while you're praying, even asking Jesus for a greater sense of your dependence on him, and your need for him. Not that we want to be asking him for suffering. We never want to ask for that. But anything that draws us near to him, I think will keep the Bible from becoming a book. Mm. And we'll, we'll keep it being the living words of the living God, the words that we need, you know, the promises that we must cling to in order to walk this walk until yeah. we see him face to face. So that's what I would say. Yeah. So a couple of minutes ago, you mentioned meditation. And I think that's one of those topics that sometimes we can feel a little bit like, I'm not I'm really sure what that means. I'm not sure what that looks like. I know what it is to read my Bible, but what does it mean to meditate on it? And it, one, one listener wrote in, what are some of the ways that you go about meditating on the scriptures that you read mm-hmm. throughout the day? Yes, because this, this is hard. Sometimes I'll get to the end of the day and I'll think, what did I read this morning? <laughs> you know, and you can't remember. The day um, is so full. It's so full. Or did yeah. I, Lord did I acknowledge you today? You know, the days just blow by. And so this is a great question. And it's one that that I ask all the time is how can I keep in my mind and heart what I read? For me, it's in the morning. I read in the morning. So that's kind of how you define meditating. Yes, thank you. Keeping those words in your mind and your heart throughout the day. Yeah. Thinking on God's word so that it sticks with you. Mm. Enjoying it, right? Not just, you know, for continuing with the metaphor of eating, not just snarfing and inhaling your food, but enjoying it. Yeah. Right? tasting its flavors, asking questions about the text. Who is God? What does he say? Who, who does he say that I am? What is the church? You know, how does, how does this apply to the spiritual realm? What is God asking me to do in response to this? Those are all ways to meditate. Mm. But just some ideas, because I'm very practically, I'm asking this question every day. And I would say just choose one verse or one promise, or maybe it's a command to keep with you. So Choose one. (laughs) You don't have to remember the entire passage. Just pick one. Just pick something from it. Ask the Spirit to bring it to mind. I've been convicted lately that, like James says, you do not have because you do not ask. Okay, Holy Spirit, I find so many days I get to the end of my day and I have not thought about what I read. Please would you bring this to mind? Please would you... In you know intense moments in our house or or conflicts at work or whatever it may be, while I'm taking a walk, would you please bring it to my mind? So ask him for help. Ask him to do that. Um, but a couple practical ideas. A while ago, I kept my Bible open in the kitchen, so maybe keeping it open in a room that you visit often, hmm. so that you can look at it. Write it on your hand. I have a friend who writes the first letter of each word of the verse on her hand. And then when she looks at it, it's a reminder to think about it Yeah. or even a, a memorize it. A little memory it. aid. Yep. Yeah. A little memory aid. Write it on your hand. Um, I've heard of friends setting phone reminders and it'll pop up with the verse. <laughs> <laughs> so they just look at it yeah. and it causes them to think about the Lord and to meditate on what they read that morning. Do it with your kids, you know, open the word. At, let's say you read in the morning and then your kids, you know, at breakfast or lunch or whenever you want to do something with them. Go to that verse, open it with them. Talk about it with them. I also keep just a little Psalms Bible by my bed. So at night, I just read, not even a whole Psalm, just a section. And I think about it as I fall asleep. Mm. Not only does it help me fall asleep (laughs) in a peaceful way, but it's just another way to meditate on scripture. So I think there are many ways we can do it throughout the day. Those are just a few. Yeah. What I like about those is that many of them, most of them even, were just these small little things. They don't necessarily require a whole new dedicated time in the day and you know, 30 minutes of no distractions and no interruptions. Uh, It's Mm -hmm. just little things throughout the day to help keep God's word on the forefront of your mind. It takes a little bit of intentionality. Uh, and Maybe it entails some habits that we want to build, but it's really not that complicated or not that burdensome. Right. And the small things add up. Yeah. 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 
so maybe another question then related to memorization. Uh, we're getting into that zone here. And that's another one of those topics that many, if not most, if not all of us can feel a little bit guilty about because we don't feel like we memorize scripture as much as we should. And so uh, someone writes in, as someone who struggles with recall due to a past illness, mm. what methods can I use to help me as I read and study scripture to be able to better remind myself of the truths of God's word, as well as to better engage with others uh, during group Bible studies or something like that? Yeah. What advice would you give to somebody well, who's like that? First of all, praise God for your desire to keep memorizing scripture, even though you struggle with recall. And I'm sorry to hear that. Mm. That's that's hard. Um, when you've gone through an illness that affects you physically, that's just a very hard thing. And so I praise, I praise God for you right now and your desire. Remember grace. Start there and just remember that God does not love you more today because you memorized or tried to memorize a verse or a, a section of verses. We need to remember the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think some, for some of us who struggle with physical limitations, and that's part of my story too, is mm. some, you know, some past health struggles that have affected present living, right? Yeah. And um, it can be easy to be hard on myself, but I think that we need to remember grace and remember that, you know, your salvation is not based on your ability to memorize verses. So I think we need to start there. Second, I would say, you know, if, if someone with a broken leg said, how can I start to walk again or perhaps it's a more permanent injury. How can I start to walk again? You wouldn't blame them for using a, some kind of a crutch or a help, right? Yeah. If you need that, use it. Maybe memorizing large chunks of scripture, you know, just isn't feasible in this season of your life and you need the note cards. Great. Use the <laughs> note cards. That That is so honoring to God. He sees your heart. Mm. Um, use the note cards, journal, write things down. I find too that that not only helps me memorize, but just helps me take it into my heart. Because the point is that we're we're wanting God's word to change us, mm -hmm. to increase our love for him, to make us more like him. So if writing it down, journaling it, does that for you, do that. Again, listening to the Bible is sometimes a different way of cognitively receiving it. So, you know, if you need some kind of a help, then take it and use it and just praise God for it. Yeah. You know? That's okay. Any advice for someone who, who, if they were being honest, would say, you know, I don't have any of those physical limitations or, or hindrances to memorizing scripture. I just, I just struggle yeah. to feel motivated. It feels hard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my memory isn't as sharp as it maybe once was when I was a kid. What about them? What advice would you give to someone who's like, I, I want to start doing this mm -hmm. more consistently, more intently? Yeah. Well, that, I would say that's been me more recently since my kids were born. Because prior to that, I would have said I was pretty well versed in the Bible. And so I could probably find things easily or paraphrase them pretty easily. But like memorizing, you know, word for word, it just, frankly, it wasn't a huge part of my walk mm. and, and part of my life. You know, when friends started talking about doing that with their kids, I just kind of felt the conviction about it. Because I was like, I do want more of the word hidden away in my heart. Imagine that Bibles were confiscated or something crazy like that. Would I know God's word? So there have been some great books written about methods. I would say if you really need some practical ideas, grab one of those books, Memorizing Scripture by Glenna Marshall. There's a lot of them out there. And again, start small, I would say. It's great to memorize an entire book of the Bible, but <laughs> maybe just start with a verse Yeah. if you want to build up. Similarly to when we meditate, we probably memorize more than we realize. Uh, so any of those methods for meditation will probably help you. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap there. Yeah, there is a lot of overlap. But we, my kids and I have really enjoyed setting verses to rhythms. You know, we're kind of a musical family. We really appreciate music. And I studied music in college. And so that, that kind of comes more naturally to me. It may not for everyone. If you're kind of rhythmically inclined, you know, set... Uh, scripture to rhythms because it, man, it has helped me to memorize. Oh, yeah. And now like the kids and I will just start, we'll just start talking through Psalm 23 and it's to a beat and it makes it so much easy to memorize. And then when I'm praying and I don't have my Bible, it's just there. So it's kind of a fun way to do it. Yeah. yeah. So good. Again, there's so many kind of creative ways yeah. and there's so many music, people out you know, there who use music and yeah, who've thought of ideas like that. There's even whole albums I know that are just scripture set to music mm -hmm. that you can stream on iTunes and that's right and another uh, really moving question that we received that maybe represents a lot of people who might be experiencing different levels of, of grief is from someone 
uh, who writes in, I became a widow on July 4th, 2020, and it became very difficult for me to study the word after that. Mm -hmm. I was not angry at God, and I knew that he was always there, but I just lost the passion during my grief. How do you suggest I rekindle the love of the word while still walking through grief? Mm. Yeah, I'm so sorry to hear about your loss. Grief is, it's just so hard. It's just so hard to, to walk through, to feel like you're not isolated in your grief. And I love the question because I, I hear in the question just such a desire to be close to the Lord. Mm. And I would say use the Psalms. The Psalms, you know, were Israel's prayer book, their book of prayers. And you will find there pretty much every emotion under the sun, including a lot of grief and a lot of sadness. And so if that's where you need to land to give voice to your grief and voice to your sadness, I would say use the Psalms. I mean, listen to this. Psalm 6, verse 6. I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. Mm. Psalm 102, 2. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Like how many of us feel like he's far when we're in distress? So there is is very real emotion here. And God is not saying, stuff it down. That's not right. He's giving you words to pray, right? Um, So I would say go to the Psalms and Again, we're remembering grace here. We're rem- we are remembering that God knows our frame and that he remembers that we are dust. He is the one who wept in the face of death when Lazarus died. He understands. And that's a real balm when you're hurting. Yeah. Maybe a question that's relevant for, for someone in your stage of life and in my stage of life, parents with young kids. And, and sometimes it feels like those years... There's a certain kind of unique busyness that can come with those early years. Uh, This person writes in, It seems like when I sit down to read scripture or pray, my kids become even more rambunctious. If God desires me to love his word, why is it so often so hard to sit down and enjoy my reading or my time with him as a parent of young kids? Hmm. Wow, what a good question. (laughs) I'm just nodding my head as I hear that. Um, Yeah, why is it so hard? A number of reasons. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is life is just hard, right? Like it's just, there's a lot of toil. There's a lot of joy too, but there's rarely a perfect and convenient time Hmm. to sit down and read scripture. What a great point. So sometimes we kind of, we're looking for that convenient. What's the idea of quiet time, time, right? This cultural construct that things have to be ideal before I can get into the word. Now that being said, this person is clearly hungry. And if you are, If you are hungry and you are feeling malnourished, maybe you need to ask someone to take your kids away from you for a little while. (laughs) And you do need that time. That time is not wrong. Maybe you need to go to a quiet place, a library, a coffee shop. Ask, you know, ask your husband, ask grandparents, a church member. Maybe you need that time alone with the Lord. So definitely seek it. I'm not telling you not to seek it. But I also think because of this, construct of quiet time, we have this ideal that can sometimes keep us from the word um, anytime Mm. when it's not like an ideal situation. So you can't get the ideal, then it's not even worth doing anything. Right. Um, Oh, who was it? Was it Susanna Wesley who used to put put an apron over her head? She had like six kids or something. And she would say, when aprons over mom's head, mom's praying, don't disturb me. (laughs) You know I mean? Isn't that it? Like your kids are running around screaming. And, um, and so I would say just your, your heart is in the right place. You know that, that the Lord wants you to prioritize his word. How can you get that in in fresh and creative ways without giving into kind of this false guilt that it has to be a certain way while still recognizing that hunger and asking someone for help maybe if you do need to get away and have some quiet? I think it's probably both, mm-hmm. right? I think it's a great question. Because young kids are hard <laughs> and they're loud well, in the best way. We love them, Matt, right? And, and maybe that relates even to the n- another question we got. Uh, how do I implement a Bible study or even just lead my kids in reading the Bible? I find it difficult to do a Bible study on my own, but I, well, I want to introduce something to my, mm-hmm. my kids. Uh, is it too early to start having them learn the Bible with me? Yeah, never too early. And my answer for this question definitely applies to the previous question as well. Your church is a gift. 
um, when you go to church on a Wednesday or a Sunday or whenever it is, God is serving you his word and you get to feast on it. And this is perhaps your main source of spiritual nourishment. It's not your own individual time in God's word. That is very, very good and we should pursue it. When we think about what the Bible is, it's actually God's words addressed to God's gathered people all the way through. So your church really matters. Mm -hmm. When you go to church, busy mom, when you go to church on a Sunday morning, send your kids to Sunday school because not only is this going to be feeding their souls, but your soul as you said under the preaching of the word. And so for the for the mom with toddlers, is it too early? It is never too early for your kids to receive the word with their church family. It is never too early for you to open the Bible, to make it a habit of it, as Deuteronomy 6 says. You know, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Do it when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. It's just all the time. It's in your conversations, it's in your disciplinary moments, it's the literal opening of the Bible, you know, maybe before bed or, or a storybook Bible. It's just throughout your lives, mm. right? It's God's word is our life because we love him. And, um, and kids are sponges and they can also handle a lot more than we think that they can. So I would just, just encourage that mom to not underestimate what her kids are able to absorb Mm -hmm. because the spirit can really use that. So as uh, a self-professed type A type person, uh, I wonder, have you ever struggled with maybe something similar to the whole quiet time idea that that when it comes to leading our kids in the Bible, it has to look a certain way. It has to kind of have a certain maybe consistency or formality or extended time to it where, you know, I'm envisioning my kids sitting down all quietly around a table and they've all got their rivals (laughs) open and they're they're listening attentively to, to what we're saying. But most, more, most often it doesn't really feel like it works out that way. So is there something to that where we have to maybe be okay with the as we're going about our day dynamic to yeah. teach oh, our kids? Absolutely. Guilty of that. Thinking it needs to be a certain way. <laughs> yes. Um, I, think we, I think we reach for the realistic, not the ideal. And again, the small things add up. I will say, I think a major influence for good and for ill has been the internet and social media. We have so many awesome resources that it can feel wonderful for parents to to be equipped, but also overwhelming. We can even start to compare ourselves. Oh, they're doing that. We're not doing that. We must be failing. I feel that all the time. And so I think it's helpful to just say, what's one thing that I that we could implement? And it can be simple. This morning, my kids and I pulled out uh, a card. It's like flashcards. We're using flashcards that has a verse to look up and a thought about it and a prayer. Just very, very simple. And I think the baby was screaming. (laughs) And I think we were telling my son to please come sit down five times. And my daughter's, you know, she knows how to read now. So she's trying to read and she's saying, brother, please be quiet, you know, (laughs) but we're doing it. And I think that that's probably the point is just that Mm -hmm. we, we show our children that God is infinitely valuable and that he is the most to be treasured. And, um, we're building that foundation and that worldview. We're introducing our children to Jesus. And how we do that looks different. Mm-hmm. But as long as we're doing it, that's great. Yeah. You know, I think they can handle more than we think that they can. Yeah. That's so, that's so encouraging. It is. It is. I mean, yeah, last couple of questions. And this one relates to just our our emotions, our affections, how we feel about the Bible sometimes. Someone writes in, how much should I worry about how I feel about reading the Bible? If I feel like I don't want to, but I know that I should, and then do it out of obedience rather than genuine desire, is that wrong? Is that legalism? Yeah, we, I think we often use the word legalism, but I think we maybe mean like hypocrisy Hmm. because legalism is trying to earn your salvation. So if you're, if you're reading your Bible to try to earn your salvation, then that is legalism. And right. you won't earn your salvation by work. reading your Bible. It's not going to work. It's by grace we're saved through faith in Christ, right? But I think you're talking about a sense of hypocrisy, right? Like, if I, oh, if I'm not feeling like reading my Bible, but then I do it anyway. Am I being a hypocrite? I think mm. that's what you're asking. When really, it sounds to me like you're trying to do the right thing. God commands us to live in his word, to abide in him, to hold fast to the word of life. So... Is my obedience to God's command 
hypocrisy? I suppose it could be if I'm not doing it to know him, if I'm just opening my Bible to check off a list. But if you're coming because you really want to know God and you're just feeling like, oh, my, my heart's just not in it right now, but I'm wrestling and I, I really want my heart to be in it right now. So am I just being a hypocrite by not coming? I would say no. I would say you're obeying the Lord, <laughs> which is honoring to him. And back to our illustration. So what if I chose to exercise even when I didn't feel like it? Would you call me a hypocrite? Mm. If I ate my veggies, even though I didn't want to. Yeah. If I continue to care for my kids, even though it didn't really feel life-giving to me in the moment, you would say, you're doing what's best, Yeah. right? So, you know, oftentimes the hardest pursuits are the worthiest ones. And oftentimes our feelings have a way of catching up to our choices. Um, The more I exercise, the more I want to exercise, right? Yeah. And so when you obey the Lord and you abide in him, even when when you don't feel like it, not only does that honor him, but I have a hunch that your feelings are going to catch up Hmm. over time. Where do you think that that sense though that we can sometimes feel that, Mm -hmm. "Ah, I don't feel like doing this and so maybe it's not worth doing it at all. Where does that come from? Because I think when when you do apply it to other things like, exercise Mm -hmm. or taking care of our kids, we kind of intuitively get that we still have a responsibility to do these things and actually it's still good and admirable, Mm -hmm. maybe even in some ways more admirable to do things even when we don't want to do them because we know it's the right thing to do and it's good for us or good for others. Mm -hmm. We don't think that way often when it comes to reading the Bible or even other spiritual disciplines. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think we might struggle with this in the spiritual realm because it's the spiritual realm. We're walking by faith here in this life and on this earth, not by sight. And it's hard to keep coming to someone that I cannot see Mm -hmm. with my own two eyes, who is working in my heart in an unseen way by his spirit, whom I cannot see. We are visual, we're tactile. We're also very much influenced by our time and place and our culture seeing is believing (laughs) immediate gratification is king feelings are truth truth is not truth feelings are truth Mm. and so i think it is the great challenge of the christian life but the beauty of it is god has actually given me something that i can see his words on a piece of paper (laughs) and what a beautiful thing to be able to recognize that this will be a struggle and then push back against it and keep coming Mm. to his words and clinging to his words and asking him to be at work through his words and trusting that he, that he is. Mm. Maybe as a last question, uh, someone writes in, if God's word is infinitely valuable and no sinful person like either of us truly deserves its riches, can I really love it enough? And, Mm. And how would I know when and if I do love it enough? It kind of goes back to the core idea of yeah. your book, hungering after God's word. I like this person's expressing just a sense of like, how can we ever actually hunger about uh, hunger after enough? Or is there a point where we know, you know, I, I've I've made it? Yeah. Oh, it makes me think of what Paul's words in Romans eleven, when he, it's like an it's an exclamation when he says, "Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways!" Who has known the mind of the Mm. Lord, right? I think you're hitting on something really wonderful that at times I'm sure could feel frustrating to us, but it's really wonderful. We will never exhaust the riches of the mind of God, which means we just can keep coming back (laughs) and hearing from him and asking to be transformed in the renewing of our minds so that we think like him. So will we ever love hearing from him enough? Will we ever hunger fully in this life? I think the answer is probably no. Um, our capacity has been seriously inhibited mm-hmm. by sin. But can we hunger more? Can we love more? Can we grow? Yes. And that is great news. Mm. So what are some indications that we're growing? I think that was part of the question. How, how can we know if we're growing in love? I would say you're, you're, you're drawn to God, a living person, the person of Christ, not just to a book. I'm coming to the word because I want you, Lord. Not just, again, checking Mm -hmm. the box. Knowledge of books of the Bible. Yeah, you feel feel hungry, especially when you're away from it. You know, have you ever felt that lack when you're in a season of uh, the newborn phase or 
a season of intense sickness or whatever it may be, you feel the lack. Something is missing. Mm. You're deeply hungry. Um, You find your thoughts, your words, your decisions, your actions are being increasingly governed by the word. You're more aware of God's presence with you as you're reading, even throughout the day. You know, we talked about meditating, growing in the awareness that he is God and he is near. Do, does worldly input and do worldly voices become less appealing to you and less influential upon you? I think those are, you know, several questions we could ask. Mm-hmm. But I love the heart behind that question. Yeah. You know, and it's just such a sweet thing that his word is inexhaustible. Yeah. That's why I love the the core metaphor that you have of God's word being this feast that we hunger for. And it's the idea of this God's word is this feast that just keeps on keeps on satisfying us and our our appetite for it can just keep growing and actually ironically the more we eat of it the more we want Mm, to eat more that's That's such an encouraging thought as all of us struggle to to make this a priority to make these habits to hunger after god's word more than we do today he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things Mm. that's a promise Mm. yeah well kristen thanks so much for uh, yeah answering some of these questions that we received and hopefully it's an encouragement to many of the people listening today Oh, I sure hope it is. Thanks so much. That was Kristen Weatherall answering your questions about cultivating a hunger for God's word. For more, be sure to check out her book with Crossway, Help for the Hungry Soul, Eight Encouragements to Grow Your Appetite for God's Word. Pick up a print copy of the book for 30% off or get the ebook or audiobook for 50% off directly for Crossway directly from Crossway by visiting crossway.org slash plus. For more audio content like this, subscribe to the Crossway podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, consider sharing it with a friend and leaving us a review. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.